The Deacons, as you know, probably know, the, is a festival started by a festival of ideas started by the state government in 2001. Deacons have always gone under the slogan "Brilliant Ideas," uh, "Big Ideas, Brilliant Minds." This year, where the big idea is that we're addressing is the really dominant one. Uh, the one that we can't escape, particularly uh, given our position in Australia and our experience in Australia, but as the world moves towards the Copenhagen event at the end of the year, the big idea is climate change, and the big issue for which we need brilliant minds is how to respond to this incredibly important issue of climate change. This, the issue of climate change, of course, can be uh, quite overwhelming, and the idea of this series is to turn around and optimistically look at what can be done by those who have uh, brilliance, uh, uh, energy, commitment to actually start to build the economy, the low-carbon economy, which we know we need, and to start to build it now. And throughout the series, and there are two lectures this week, uh, which, and the series will continue until the end of the year, what we're trying to do is to look at different aspects of the low carbon economy as we've come to understand it, and to do that through the celebration and exposure of people who have come to Australia for this lecture and the events surrounding the lecture, because we feel that they are engaged in one aspect of uh, the low carbon economy and because their work is very significant in terms of advancing the transformation which has to take place towards that new economy. Now, we all know that part of that economy is about renewable energy, and so it would obviously have not been possible to have this festival without, to some extent, addressing the issue of renewable energy. And tonight's speaker, it seems to me, um, fits all of our criteria. I can't imagine a person um, more uh, appropriate to this series to talk to us about renewable energy, particularly solar energy, than Dr. David Mills. Um, throughout the series uh, of, of lectures, we have entrepreneurs, we have academics, we have researchers, we have people who play an, a role in new institutions in government. Um, David is one of those people who embraces many of those uh, categories He's both a physicist, a researcher. Um, he's made uh, a, a very, very significant contribution to research in New South Wales, first at the University of New South Wales and then at Sydney University, to particular research on solar energy. Many of you who've seen the uh, very popular form of solar panels for solar, he solar hot water heating, the ones that are evacuated tubes, David led the research that developed the coatings that make those work. And I see those now, not just only in my own roof, but in roofs all over the world. Um, David, I think, uh, represents the kind of person that we want to celebrate in this festival because He's uh, that kind of researcher who has, right through his career as I've known it, been actively involved in trying to bring about change uh, in terms of uh, taking on the position, as he held for many years, of the in president of the International Solar Energy Society, for building, constructing solar panels, for testing them out, uh, for producing new ideas, for building prototypes, and now, of course, uh, he's here as the, um, and his role within a com the commercial sphere, joining us because he left Australia in 2007 to set up in California in the, com com in the company he now runs, OSRA. And so he is uh, the kind of academic we all really need, those who can be involved in research and those who actually help to make, to translate that research into action. I should say that it's very important that David is here tonight as the founding um, entrepreneur in residence, the new entrepreneur re in residence program of the Victorian Endowment for Science, Knowledge and Innovation. And I'm always conf worried that I'll get that the wrong way around. Vesky, um, who are partners with us this evening. So uh, it's with great pleasure that I ask uh, uh, to the stage Dr. David Mills.
Well, thank you, Professor Ryan, for that, uh, I think, overkind uh, introduction, but uh, very nice to hear anyway. Um, uh, and uh, also, thank you uh, to the many people I've met uh, over the last uh, few days. It's been a wonderful experience uh, meeting with uh, the people in the Victorian Endowment of Science, Technology, and Innovation. And um, they, I want to thank uh, very much for making it possible for me be to be there today. It's also a great honor for me to have been invited to give this Al Alfred Deacon lecture. Um, I read up on the man, and uh, he wasn't just a man of words, although he liked words. Uh, he, he also liked deeds and uh, did, did a, a lot of positive things in society in a lot of different areas. Um, photons, um, this talk is about photons initially, but really it's about solar energy. I'm going, I'm going to take away the drama so we don't have to hunt, hunt too much in the talk. Photons, uh, photons are unimaginably small entities which we cannot visualize, both because they're incredibly small and because they have aspects of both solid matter and waves that our senses are not equipped to process. But we can and do sense large numbers of them as light and radiant heat. Indeed, without the myriads we experience every day reflected from our surroundings, we couldn't see anything at all. Most of the photons we interact with are produced by nuclear fusion reactions uh, inside our favorite star, uh, the sun, and they stream down on our planet as solar energy. These photons are the source of almost all the energy used by living beings in the Earth's biosphere. Photons provide energy to drive the wind and waves in our climate system. This combined energy and climate system is billions of years old and thousands of times larger than our fossil fueled commercial energy economy. Although volcanoes and earthquakes result from heating by radioactive decay in the depths of the Earth, that source of heat is very small by comparison. Practically all of the energy that warms the surface of the Earth comes from solar photons. Solar energy is not a resource for just a few lucky nations, it's everywhere. Our beautiful blue planet is a very special one, uh, accepting photons from its star and radiating them away at just the right rate to maintain a surface temperature on the Earth such that water is mostly kept in the liquid state, which we need to survive. Uh, therefore, it's excellent real estate for us, and then it's in the best part of town if you look at where it's placed in the, the galaxy. Everyone knows that trees and plants provide the oxygen that we breathe and decrease carbon dioxide, but green plants also darken the Earth's surface and affect the Earth's reflectivity, sometimes called the albedo. That regulates our temperature to, or helps regulate our temperature to comfort comfortable levels. Trees in the high latitudes grow slowly and absorb more sunlight than that the snow underneath uh, would have, and therefore, by, by virtue of being there, they warm the earth. Uh, trees near the equator grow vigorously and pull carbon out of the atmosphere, and they cool the earth. Uh, trees planted in, planted in temperate climates are these days thought to have little effect on the climate, so remember that when you do your next carbon offset. Uh, the best scheme that we ha would have is to stop cutting trees down in Sumatra, uh, Brazil, and the Congo. Plants and algae are ancient life forms that have had more time to become energetically sophisticated than we are. Instead of having to burn pieces of wood or lumps of coal or hydrocarbons to keep warm, and, or instead of having to eat other species, they're able to borrow photons directly from the photon river incident on the Earth using the process of photosynthesis. After the energy absorbed has been used to build tissues or create growth, uh, the leftover heat from the process um, uh, joins the outbound river of infrared photons that travel back into space, cooling the Earth. Plants have shown that tapping temporarily into our huge river of photons is truly sustainable. They've been doing it for billions of years. So an, the natural photon-based ecology is safe and it's resilient and should be the inspiration for our commercial energy economy. Currently, it is not. Our prehistoric human economy was originally built largely around hunting and gathering food uh, uh, generated by solar photons. It was a photon-based economy. The main reasons for the recent focus on coal and oil are the exceptional energy density of fossil fuels and the fact that they can be easily transported and sold. In the early 20th century, you couldn't transport sunlight or wind but you could make a global business out of extracting and transporting fossil fuel. So fossil fuel is solar energy, which has been stored by nature in chemical form in the Earth over millions of years. Uh, it arrives slowly, but can be liberated quickly. 
Now that would not be such a problem if the reaction products from combustion were harmless. But combustion of fuel damages the thermal regulation of the atmosphere through carbon-based pollutants such as carbon dioxide, black soot, and leakages of methane. That increases the net number of photons absorbed and causes global warming. In its most dire forecast to date, the IPCC, uh, the International Panel for Climate Change, predicts that by the end of the century, the average surface temperature of the Earth uh, could increase by as much as five to seven degrees Celsius with groups such as uh, MIT and the UK Hadley Center leaning toward five degrees at present, but they keep raising it, if you've noticed. This leads to melted glaciers in modeling, huge species lost, flooded shorelines, and long periods of drought that could persist for hundreds of years. One thing that people, most people are not aware of is that in any scenario, the temperature rises on the land are about 40% higher than the global average. So when we say five degrees, we are talking closer to nine degrees uh, Celsius in, uh, over land areas. And much of Australia, away from the coasts, would may be uninhabitable if we experience a seven degree average uh, global temperature rise. So this is a very critical area for Australia. Uh, is Australia, in fact, going to exist as, as a country uh, if this goes to the extreme? If you want a really good fright, uh, go to the website uh, climateprogress, all one word, dot org, and you'll see it all there. We're still finding new and damaging impacts within this very complex system. Research in 2003 from climate pioneer Jim Hansen uh, of NASA and uh, colleagues at Columbia University showed that more than 25% of the increase in average global temperatures between 1880 and 2002 may be due to black soot contamination of snow and ice worldwide. Soot comes from diesel engines, those things that we encourage with subsidies sometimes in, uh, in Europe. Um, uh, smoldering wood fires are bad, uh, old coal-fired plants are bad as well. In a new study in the journal Nature, Stanford professor Mark Jacobson writes, soot, or black carbon, may be responsible for 15 to 30 percent of global warming. Yet it's not even considered in any of the discussions about controlling climate change at present. Glaciers have surprised scientists by melting faster than predicted, but when you factor in soot, you find that the glacier melting rates make sense. At those rates, we're likely to lose the northern ice cap uh, in summer sometime in the next decade. Our high energy civilization runs on coal, oil, and gas, and these fuels are small compared with the utilization of solar photons. We are completely dependent, in fact, on this photon ecology, a naturally occurring interconnected physical and biological system. Within that ecology, each human eats secondhand solar energy in the form of food supplied by plants and animals. Uh, and so they don't use coal or oil for that purpose. Humans now utilize more than half the photosynthesis on the planet for agriculture and their own purposes. That's an astonishing st statistic to me. Solar photons keep the earth warm as well. We'd be very quickly starving to death or freezing to death if the sun were suddenly extinguished. But while we are kept alive by photons and we need them to survive, they're also capable of making life extremely uncomfortable for us, for us if we upset the system. And some say that we've already triggered our demise because the permafrost is melting in the Arctic. It's releasing methane, uh, a strong greenhouse gas. The further uh, this uh, goes into the atmosphere, incre increasing global warming, the more melt you get and the faster it comes off. This is a, uh, a cycle which is a pernicious cycle that could lead to catastrophic global warming and that it's not the only such cycle that scientists know about. Like the Earth's climate and ecology, modern human economies are complex systems. The dramatic economic shutdown of the last year should lead us to conclude that we are not as good at understanding complex systems uh, as we might like to believe. In a kind of optimism worthy of Dr. Pangloss, the free market was deemed uh, by neoclassical economists to be the best of all possible worlds. Uh, forgetting completely the lessons of the Great Depression, the US government left the hen house to the foxes of Wall Street to manage, and everyone ended up with egg on their faces. The Prime Minister Kevin Rudd uh, commented on the situation in 2008. It's perhaps time now to admit that we did not learn the full lessons of the greed is good ideology. And today we are still cleaning up the mess of the 21st century children of Gordon Gekko. Yet we still use economic excuses uh, to delay carbon taxes, 
and we delay renewable energy subsidies, often for economic reasons uh, or for uh, nominally the, the economy. We still do not heed the needs of our future ecology, uh, which demand almost zero emissions by mid-century to keep our temperature rise around two degrees average. You will hear of the US and UK targets up to 80% reduction, and it's always nice to make a target further out because you can be more confident about doing that one. But, uh, by meds, but these do not factor in population growth and the rise in living standards in developing countries. If you anticipate that they're going to rise in living standards and use more energy, you find that all of the slack is gone. That, in fact, we have to uh, uh, go to uh, or simply stop emitting carbon. Now, Al Gore and Jim Hansen of NASA are calling for an almost wartime footing. Too tepid a response is getting us into very hot water. The move away from photons to fossil fuel was a factor in the rapid economic development of Western society in the 19th and 20th centuries, but you may be surprised to learn that fossil fuel was never a necessity for modern civilization to happen. Welding of metals was practiced by Europeans in Leonardo's time using, using focused solar beams. Water mills provided hydraulic power in 1759. Between 1832 and 1839, Robert Anderson of Scotland invented the first crude electric carriage. A small-scale electric car was designed by uh, a professor in Groningen, Holligen, Holland, uh, and uh, built by his assistant in 1835. Uh, practical and more successful electric road vehicles were invented by both American Thomas Davenport and Scotsman, Scotsman uh, Robert Davidson around 1842. An early solar plant around 1890 in Needles, California had thermal storage. Um, in 1885, uh, alternating current hydroelectricity was developed by Nikola Tesla and George Westinghouse. Fra Frank Schumann built a solar plant in Egypt in 1912, which pumped water but could easily have driven an electric generator. And in fact, there were magazines of the time uh, with, which sketched such a system exactly. An iron-based battery car devised by a, 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 a partnership between Thomas Edison and Henry Ford uh, lost a market battle with petrol car companies, even though the early bat battery problems had been solved by that time. Solar water heaters on homes were widespread in 1920. Some of you will see this, the heater in that uh, photograph on the top right uh, in, on the roof. It looks just like today. <laughs> One could go on and on. A non-carbon economy was about to happen a century ago, but we took a wrong turn. Why did we do that? Well, one thing that held back the photon economy was the lack of a large electricity distribution grid. Uh, this allows the transport and sale of uh, renewable energy in electrical form. Otherwise, it's a bit hard to transport for sunlight in a bottle. But although uh, invented by Edison in the 1880s, the electric grid has taken many, many years to establish. It was not by any means complete, and so most people had to do something else. More money could be made in 1920 by mining and transporting the fossilized concentrated solar energy called coal and oil than by surfing the Photon River. And of course, nobody had yet heard of global warming. Had we not discovered oil and large coal reserves and the means to extract them quickly, where would we be now? Well, we might be healthier because we would have a clean atmosphere. Uh, we would not fear, fear global warming. We probably would, wouldn't even know about it at this stage. Uh, the streets would be quiet because we'd be running electric vehicles. Perhaps we would uh, be wealthier as well because we could have powered our economy without the import of oil from other countries and we would not have faced expensive energy war politics and uh, the health costs of pollution that we now uh, bear. Okay, so uh, I always get the question, why not use nuclear power? Well, uh, we already have a really large free fusion reactor of an advanced type uh, available to anyone at a safe distance of 140 million kilometers, and we do not have to worry about radioactive waste from that particular one. Even if one used up all of the warheads, there isn't enough fuel to last beyond mid-century at current reactor numbers unless when one invokes the fast breeder plutonium economy. And uh, about the plutonium economy in 2003, an MIT report was written about that and deemed it unacceptably dangerous. This was written by nuclear people. This is uh, mainly a terrorism issue because it involves transport of plutonium around the, uh, the, the country. 
With or without the fast breeder, harvesting, harvesting neutrons on the earth involves technology that can be used to make bombs and terrorist devices. India and Pakistan are perfect examples of how weapons can proliferate from a supposedly peaceful program. And the current debate about Iran is just a taste of the chaos we can expect with widespread nuclear power. In the end, the solution for global warming is not nuclear winter. In fact, the neutron economy is not the path uh, proven by nature at all. It is the photon path. In the new photon economy, things that burn fossil fuel are replaced by photon trapping devices we can make and sell. These are called solar collectors or direct solar energy converters, and that's what we do in our company. But solar photons also stir up the atmosphere to produce winds and waves and ocean currents, and uh, these are also ways to tap into the photon river or the energy from it. These are called indirect solar energy, and the products are called wind turbines, uh, water turbines, and wave generators. As part of the photon economy, uh, there might be other actions. It might be cheaper to sell more efficient products of all types that simply use less energy. But we need a system that rewards such energy saving appropriately. And California, uh, as in, in one of many innovative programs, introduced such a system in the 80s, in which electric and gas utilities were paid the same whether or not they saved energy or generated more. Uh, Californian energy usage has been held constant now for two decades under that system, and um, it is now much lower per capita than the other U.S. states. The Earth cares little about whether we use increased efficiency or use more zero emissions energy. Um, so whatever's the cheapest is best. Sustainable biomass can be turned into a fuel. Uh, this is a kind of a gray area, though. It involves uh, uh, excessive land competition with food agriculture on some, in some occasions, and land requirements in total are far too great to run the whole uh, global economy. But I think biomass for jet fuel is a very good fit of market size to resource. Uh, when I was president of the International Solar Energy Society a decade ago, we wrote, wrote a letter to Richard Branson uh, in the hope that he might reply, but also the, suggesting that uh, he fund the line of uh, development, but uh, we got no response out of that. But now, 10 years on, the airlines are getting the, the idea, and many airlines are cooperating on the production of uh, jet fuel from biomass. Uh, and uh, I think the resource is just about right for that, that size of industry. Finally, there's desalination. Desalination in some parts of Australia is a very dirty word. Um, uh, it, the, the debate about desalination became acrimonious. But water is essential for Australia's future, especially when we consider that future drought conditions caused by global warming may be very severe. Rain clouds are natural desalination. They are vectors of, uh, of that. And solar photons merely kick water molecules up from the ocean uh, in, into the air as water vapor and leave the dissolved solids in the ocean. If we use solar power to desalinate water, we are actually doing the same thing. We're using the same original source and we're providing the same product at the end. Now, um, the main difference is that we have to take some care and, and uh, take care to not to over, uh, locally overload the seabed that's in the region of the plant with highly saline water. This can be done by good design, but it is an important part of uh, looking after the earth. Recycling water is a good thing, whether it's desalinated or fresh water. Um, but using desalinated water for cities does not rob the land of water resources that would have uh, existed on the, on the land before human usage. And it's well to think of that point. I mean, pe people often forget that point that we are still taking water out if we do not desalinate. Using solar photons to make and create transport uh, fresh water has huge potential to alleviate the coming world water crisis and decrease pressure on our finite aquifers and struggling rivers. Solar energy is almost unlimited as a resource, and so fresh water potentially is as unlimited. It's only a matter of about the price. I believe that the cheapest renewable energy will come from large distance sources like solar power plants and wind turbines uh, in dedicated parks away from the home. Uh, connecting the home, the factory, the office, and the car to distant clean electricity generation infrastructure is essential to attacking global warming quickly because it uses the infrastructure we already have. It minimizes changes to buildings. It leaves most of the maintenance with the utility. A U.S. study has shown that an electrified vehicle sector would actually improve grid economics because uh, the underutilized grid at night would be used for vehicle charging. 
And in fact, uh, I have a plug-in hybrid vehicle in California, of course, uh, being a bit of a tech head, and um, uh, I do plug it in at night and uh, try to help the grid that way. And I can drive uh, two days back and forth and commuting without any use of fossil fuel whatsoever. So um, uh, when I'm not using my bike, that's my method of choice. If we get to, uh, how do we, so how do we get the electricity in the first place? Well, I think there'll be four main, this is my opinion only, mind you, and others will differ. There'll be four main types of photon power technology for that. There are many more possibilities, but these seem to be um, big ones and almost ready ones, or ready ones. Uh, they all exist already, but some are young and evolving rapidly. The first to arrive commercially was hydroelectricity in 1882. Um, that's a, that's about the picture we have of it. It was in Wisconsin in the United States. Um, I'm, I'm sorry about the picture quality, but uh, uh, it's, showing, it's showing the dam and spill, spillway uh, for that plant. Hydroelectricity was the largest generator in the USA and Australia from the 30s to the 50s. After 130 years, its potential is um, already used up in much of the developed world, where it's beginning to decrease because of declining snowmelt. 